This is After the Gridiron, a podcast featuring interviews with retired football players. If you're a fan of After the Gridiron, make sure you subscribe to the show to ensure that you won't miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Symphonies. Symphonies is an online store that provides custom clothing and accessories. They have a number of quality products available at affordable prices. They offer custom, unique, funny, and inspirational products that you won't find anywhere else. So go to www.symphonies.ca to shop for your next purchase. And as a special offer for our listeners, enter promo code GRIDIRON to get 15% off your purchase. So there's no excuse not to check it out. Again, that's www.symphonies.ca. Symphonies. Great products, great prices. Right, hello, everyone. Welcome once again to uh, After the Grid. I'm your host, Lyle Green. And today we have uh, one of the great running backs uh, to play in the NFL, uh, Larry Johnson. So Larry played seven years in the NFL. He played with the Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals, Washington Redskins, and the Miami Dolphins. He uh, was a first-round pick for the Chiefs in 2003 draft, the 27th pick overall, and uh, turned out to be a, a great uh, pick for them. He was a, ended up being a two-time Pro Bowler in the NFL and uh, and uh, did amazing things on the field. Uh, while at college, he went to uh, Penn State University and uh, was a Walter Camp Award winner, Doak Walker Award winner in 2002, also first-team All-Big Ten, and also unanimous All-American in 2002. So he's a uh, stalwart on the field, on the gridiron, definitely uh, at Penn State as well, and that transferred to the NFL. So uh, now he's uh, helping kids and doing great things for them through the organization called uh, the Motivational Edge, and you can find out all the information on that on their website, which is themotivationaledge.org. So Larry, thanks for coming on, and I appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me. All right, that's great. So, uh, yeah, I usually start off by asking the guests to say something about them that most people don't know. So what would that be for you? What's something about you that most people don't know about you? I am. I would, I would know. I, I'm basically a more of a spiritual person than I have been in the past. So a lot of people call it conspiracy theory, which is really retarded to me because it's, I'm basically an overthinker and I overanalyze everything. So I sit at home all day studying educating myself on either the Bible, spiritual matters, worldly matters. And that's all I do basically all day, all day is basically obsessed. I obsess, obsess, obsess about different things that go on in this world. And I kind of put coincidence together. So I wouldn't be called a, I don't like being called a conspiracy theorist. I'm more like an overthinker. So that's what I do in my off time. People must think I just be out outside all day or go to the clubs or drink or whatever. I don't. Yeah. I'm literally in the house all day watching film tape on different stuff that goes on in this world yeah okay so just feeding yourself uh, lots of information and trying to trying to make a difference uh, in, in that way is, is that is that's kind basically of yeah there? okay nice yep. very good good stuff all right so before we get into uh all that what you're doing now just uh let's go back to the beginning when you got started in football so i know guys get started at different ages when did when did you start playing I started playing when i was nine years old i played flag football at eight years old because you couldn't play tackle football until nine years old so i went right into tackle football at age nine. Oh, okay and uh was it uh love at first fight did you love it just playing right away or is it uh something that kind of developed as you as you got older Tell you the truth, i was scared to death oh, i didn't really? know how to hit i didn't know how to hit i didn't know anything i literally thought you just run into the guy and you just fall down the yeah. guys who knew how to play would lower their helmets this this people have to mind you this is like old school football this is not like you know you get a flag or you get kicked out if you if you spear anything, we yeah. used to spear each other, and yeah. that's what happened. And I, I got knocked out one time. I didn't want to play, but I said, "No, you, you playing." So he put me back <laughs> in there the next weekend, and I got to kind of hang of it after yeah. that. After that, okay, nice. <laughs> so, did you uh, did you play other sports as well growing up, or is it all just football? I did basketball and baseball. Basketball, but okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Most guys, yeah, play a lot of different sports or athletic enough to do to do well in other sports. All right, so you end up yeah, uh, focusing on football and playing football at uh, Penn State University. So I'm um, uh, assuming you had a, a pretty good a good uh, high school career. So can you talk about uh, the, re the recruiting process and how you end up uh, choosing uh, Penn State of all the all the schools that were coming after you? It was it was different. Everybody wasn't that many schools that were coming after me. I had Maryland, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, Northwestern. A lot of schools 
kind of faded back because my dad was already at Penn State. So at the time, they're okay. like, oh, he's not going to come to our school. His dad's already there. And people didn't understand. I would want to go. I was in state college since high school for like two years of high school. I wanted to get out of PA. Yeah. So I was I kind of going to doing my little recruiting business. And, you know, I liked the other schools, but I just I felt like I knew more about the recruiting situation at Penn State more than the other schools. And back then, you know, I, I seen a lot of kids get done dirty and not being able to play until their senior year and not being able to get on the field. So I chose Penn State only because I knew who was coming in. I knew the competition and I thought that I could obviously beat the competition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's always well, programs like Penn State, there's always competition coming in and there's always been uh, some great running backs out of that program, like yourself and the Kijana Carter and guys like that. So, uh, what what made you think that you could uh, t- uh, take out those those other those other guys the other the other competition? I just you have to have it's my work ethic and uh, and knowing that I could play like I knew I I belonged and I knew I could play. You know when I got there my freshman year and you know kind of made a, a splash on scout teams and stuff like that. I knew I belonged, but I just didn't know when I was going to get my opportunity. So I just kept plugging it away, and then you know as soon as I came out of redshirt year. I was already playing. So all I had to do was just wait my time and wait my turn for the other guys to graduate. But I knew I belonged, you know, on that field and playing and stuff like you just got to be confident in yourself. And I was just confident that I knew I could play in this, play in this uh, division. Yeah, you did have the confidence and you did uh, show that you could with uh, your great, uh, great year that you had there amassing over 2000 yards. Can you talk about that season and, and, and what it was like to, to have such a, a great uh, rushing rushing season that year, it was actually it was very very surreal to me because we all my the offensive linemen we used to, I used to have these meetings, you know, the, for like hey I'm gonna be starting so when we all get together and watch temp tape, tape and film and we joked that yeah we're gonna get two thousand this year I was like, I don't know why <laughs> we said that but we were joking about it yeah. and then sooner or later it was just you know we those got more out got close to those offensive linemen as more they got close to me and plus we were all the same. Um, the same year, same, same recruiting class. class. So we fell more together, you know. So it was just an amazing, amazing time to, you know, have those games where you go from 200 to you know, 300 games. And it's like, it, like it doesn't happen. Those things happen on Madden when you play video exactly. games. It doesn't yeah. happen in real life. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, being able to to get that many years in college is just uh, an amazing feat that, uh, that's uh, definitely rare rare to achieve. So yeah, you, you, you had a great accomplishment there for sure. So what... Um, when was it uh, in your in your career that you, you felt that you could uh, could make it to the next level? Was it something that you kind of always thought you could you could make it to the NFL, or was it something that you kind of developed and and after after a certain year you thought maybe maybe I can get to the next level? No, it was just basically when you went in there for like once I got drafted and went to preseason. You know, you always like man, should I really belong here? Because you're not playing with young kids; you're playing with grown men. You yeah. know, you're playing with people who actually been there for like been pro bowlers like you did you basically watching you guys that you watched on tv and all of a sudden you show up at practice with them it's a completely different scenario so now you out there running around and, and you know it's, it's a very humbling experience but once you make one cut or you make a good play then you get that confidence level up and think you yeah i belong here because obviously i'm good enough to play in this league yeah. and it just comes with time and it's just certain opportunities came i took advantage of it yeah, very nice. So, yeah, let's talk about uh, going into the NFL and you're uh, being selected by the Kansas City Chiefs in the first round. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, 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 anticipation and in, in wanting to know where you're going to end up. And just talk about your, your draft day and, and where you expect it to go and, and how things went on, on draft day. Uh, it, was, it was kind of nerve-wracking because I didn't understand the whole point of it. I had my heart set on going to Pittsburgh because, you know, I, Jerome oh, Banks really? is about to retire. Yeah, I was like, oh, I'm going to Pittsburgh. I got to go to Pittsburgh because <laughs> uh, Bill Cowher showed up at the at my workout. So I'm thinking, like, at Penn State workout. So I'm like, yo, I get, like to go to Pittsburgh and be in PA at Penn State already, that's just that's a one-and-two combination. Spot. Like, that's yeah. perfect spot for me. And then, then I found out uh, we had this – Marvin Demoff was my agent at the time, so he was also Troy Palomalo's agent. So when when I found that Pittsburgh slid up to switch spots at sixteen to go with uh, Troy Palomalo, yeah, I was I was excited. I was like, oh, I hit, this is my chance. Pittsburgh saw side up to get me. Then yeah. the that they didn't, and they got Troy, and then they I, they slid down. Then they told me like, hey, we're gonna try to get you at twenty seven if no one else gets you. Gets you. I'm like, oh, Kansas City. Like I don't, 
I didn't watch Kansas City football you know, play. <laughs> I was watching Eagles and Pittsburgh. Yeah. So yeah. and then when they when Carl Pearson called me and said, Hey, we're gonna select you, I didn't know how big of a deal it is for him that he selected me rather than a bigger deal for everybody else. But it was it was a weird such situ- awkward situation and obviously Carl Pearson knew what he was doing because yeah. they ended up working out for Kansas City in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so talk about uh Kind of your first day and your first few days with, uh, with the Chiefs, and I know it's not where you want to be, but uh, obviously still still in the NFL and still uh, uh, at the highest level. So talk about what it was like uh, achieving your goal and making it to making it to the NFL. Your first few days there. It was it was good. It was so good. Like it it was still a competition. You really don't really get to enjoy because you know now it's, it's the big time. Now you have to perform. You have to show up. You have to do interviews it was so much more to it than just me enjoying it so it's yeah. i really didn't get to enjoy it until after a couple of years because you really wanted to play and you really wanted to get in there and you did have to understand the logistics of only a certain number of guys can can dress up and if you don't have a specific number on defense or offense you don't dress up you don't play so it was yeah. that that was the hardest part of trying to learning the business yeah it's definitely uh the the other end of it, yeah, they have the enjoyment of playing, but there's also the business side and and realizing that it is a business, and uh, yeah, that kind of takes takes some of the the joy and fun out of out of the actually playing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, but uh, you're able to achieve some some great uh, achievements, uh, making it to a couple of Pro Bowls and and uh, doing well in, at uh, at that level. So talk about your your total experience in the in the NFL and how things uh, uh, how you felt about playing in the NFL. Uh, I felt good. Like I, like I said, it was. It's more of like nerve wracking because you have to. You want to perform every single, you know, time you're in practice. You want to get out there and play. Uh, it's just you know when you once you get your shot, like you just run with it. And it was yeah. like that was the big thing. Is like once I'm in there, I'm not coming out. So that yeah. was like when I once the priest went down in San Diego. I knew then I'm not. I'm not putting myself in a position to ever come out again. So I would play, and even times we were beating teams, they would try to send guys in that seemed like a player in it to to relieve me. I would send them back. Oh, I, yeah. I was I remember the Houston Texans game. I was close to like one eighty eight, one ninety, something like that. And they were like, they were there. we weren't trying to get me two hundred yards, but I was going to stay in there. So they were telling me, hey, you got two hundred something. I was like, I'm not coming out then. Yeah. So so uh, guys try to run over and try to get me. I was showing back. I was like, no, you're not coming out and get me. I would try to stay in there the whole game. Until like we were really going to come out, so that's what that's you know how I took advantage of actually playing, and I had a fun time like you know playing in the you know game and playing in the locker room with with guys who were just you know just like you trying to get you know find their way to to make a new contract or to be on TV. Like everybody was out there hustling, yeah. and that's the one thing I really do miss is, is the teammate com- camaraderie. Yeah, that's definitely what what you miss most about uh, about playing. Not so much the the bumps and bruises, but yeah the hanging out with the guys and, and, and having fun with the guys and doing stuff like that. So what was, what was your, what do you think was the most uh, important uh, attribute or, or mindset you had to, to be able to, to play that long and to, to make it to the NFL? What, what do you think it was? You have to have confidence. You have to have, uh, I can't really explain it. You have to have heart. Like most people don't have heart to do anything in life. They don't have heart to, to sit, to, to accept the downfalls and the setbacks and the disappointments. You have to have heart for all that. You have to be mentally tough, emotionally tough to play this game. And most yeah. guys don't have it. And me, I went into it like, I, like you would go into a war. Like yeah. you knew that you had to show up and perform or not, you don't eat the next week or you're going to get cut or just, this is how you perform. This is how the mentality you have to have. Some guys just don't have it, yeah. which is they don't stay around that long or they just, they fold on the pressure. I was, just, I was the person who always answered the bell every time they tried to put that pressure on me. It was that pressure I was already expecting on myself. So that's why I performed the way I performed, but because I was already accepting the pressure of what they wanted me to uh, to do. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely, uh, being, being in the pros, it's definitely uh, mostly uh, mental, the mental aspect of it. And a lot of guys definitely have the physical skills, but as you mentioned, yeah, the mental aspect and having the, the toughness and the resilience to, to overcome the, the tough things and to, to do the things that most people don't want to do. That's that's what makes the difference between the, the guys that make it, like you said, and the guys that, that don't make it. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's talk about uh, make it a little lighter here and talk about uh, what you did with uh, your first check. So making it to the NFL and and, and making uh, uh, some some good money. What what was a, a fun thing that you, you you bought with your with your uh, with your first check or one of your first few checks? 
I don't know. I was. I had a. I got bought a car, a G wagon. I wouldn't really attach the money like everybody else is attached. Man, I don't know why people ask no. that same question. That question. That I really hate that question when they ask you all the time. I've answered that same question so many times. Of what do you get when you get your money? I wasn't even. I didn't care about money as yeah. much as other players. It was like it was a. Yeah, it was a byproduct of you know playing in the national football because they have to pay you to play and all that stuff. But me with me and money, it would just. It was just. It, it would go like water to me. Like long yeah. as I had enough to pay for my family or do the things I want to do and actually live and eat, I didn't really care. Like I bought like a G wagon and I just did all un- insane creative things with my money other than that. But I never was too attached to it to make it to make it be that thing of what did I did with this check and all that. It was I didn't really care. It was just it was just a purpose that you paid me and I was going to make you pay me wor- wor- worth my time. That's pretty much all I looked at it as far as money. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's a lot of guys uh, kind of just do it for the money and 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 spend it wildly, and and uh, that's all they care about. But uh, yeah, that's why yeah. that's how they get broke because they attach yeah. themselves to their status being money, and that's the everything they do is for money. I've seen guys play and tank tackles and tank plays because they were scared they're gonna they're gonna get hurt and lose money. Like I oh, never right. played like that. I was I was gonna play if 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 I got hurt or whatever I got hurt, but I was gonna get hurt going one hundred ten percent. Not trying to be hurt, trying to be scared to be hurt because I didn't want to get that my, my contract or something was, was going to be affected by it. But that was, those guys were insane when they, I didn't want to play football like that. So that's no. why that I'm different from most guys when it comes to this whole money thing. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's, that's what players, that's what teams want. And that's what uh, fans want to see guys that are out there playing for the love of the game and, and giving their all and not worried about uh, you know, getting hurt and doing, you know, having their actions being, uh, dictated by by the the paycheck and what what might be coming down the road and the big contracts that may be coming down the road so we admire uh, fans and myself guys admire guys like you who who go all out and and put everything out there on the line and and give their all when they're playing so it's uh, great to see great to see guys like you out there playing all right so let's talk about uh you know post career now and and uh and uh, life after football uh, you, you said you're you're working with the the motivational edge so talk about uh how you got into that and, and, and how things went with your transition into uh, life after football. I went into uh, motivation as a guy that I knew uh, was running it. And he said, Hey, we would love to have you, you know, a guy who's playing in the national football league. We would love to have you come and talk to the kids and, uh, you know, give them some words of wisdom. I'm like, oh, you know, okay, I guess. So I wasn't doing anything anyway. And I was kind of looking for something to do. So I spoke to the kids and he's like, bro, like you, you really should do this like for a job. Like you should work with us. And I was like, I don't know, man. I was nonprofit business and and just doing things. I just didn't have the frame mind of, of wanting to do anything. Yeah. So then he, you know, obviously uh couldn't I couldn't get a job doing anything else because of, you know, being on disability from the National Football League for football related, you know, mental injuries. So basically he said, Oh, I I got a spot for you. You could be an ambassador, you can go you know, you know, spread the word about us and what we're doing in the South Florida. I said, all right, cool. I did that. So one thing led to another and I ended up, you know, becoming on the, becoming a board member and actually, you know, helping the NFL PA give um, my organization money to open up uh, the facility that we're in right now to help the kids, you know, actually come after school and actually do what they want to do and have fun and be artistic and be creative. So it came a thing that was like one thing led to another and it just all came from trying to help out kids and, understanding where they came from as far as trying to help them with their emotional issues that's awesome that yeah you're giving back to to kids and and being able to to do something that uh, you feel you feel good about and feel passionate about to 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 give back to the youngsters and and help them in their in their lives and to help them to 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 express themselves and to to be positive uh, to be positive citizens so talk about more about what what uh, specifically uh, the things that you guys do and the specific programs that you guys have there we have a dance program. We have a, um, our artistic program. We teach the kids how to 3D print. We have a 3D printing machine. Uh, we have a dance, uh, I said dance, but we have a studio. So most of the kids in South Florida, which is almost all kids now, all think they're artists and rap artists, singers, <laughs> poetry. So we get the kids at least, you know, to, to write clean lyrics, lyrics about what they've gone through in their lives and get, and get it out in a really poetic way. Then we take them to the studio. We teach them how to break down the song tracks. We teach them how to pick beats. We teach them uh, structure. So it's not like we did, they go in there and just freestyle a mixtape. No, we teach them structure. So if it's something they really want to do, they actually learn how to use the music board, how to use the, the tools and everything. Oh, nice. So they want to stay lead. Yeah. <laughs> they actually know how to understand 
song structure so they can go out and start making songs on their own. And that's kind of how we want to get them to push them in that uh, professional direction rather than just, just laying tracks and then doing whatever. Just doing it. Oh, nice. Nice. So do you have any, any students that have come through there that are, are doing well or have uh, kind of moved on to, uh, to higher things, higher spots? Uh, no, yeah, we still, like, most of those guys haven't graduated yet. So we deal with kids oh, okay. from three, third, third grade all the way up to junior and high school. Oh, so okay, right now, really most young. of our kids are like, yeah, we're really young right now. So those, most of the kids haven't, haven't left us yet. They haven't left the nest yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Nice. So yeah, hopefully we can, uh, down the road, see somebody, uh, from your, from your guys' program, uh, doing, doing good things in the music, in the music business. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So you do dance as well. So what kind of, uh, uh, dance do you guys teach lessons or how does that work too? We do almost like, you know, like aerobic style uh, dance. So most of those kids, we try to get them into still exercising. Like most of these kids don't exercise anymore. They're on their phones most of the time. They're just lounging too much. So at least with us, yeah. if they like to dance, we create a safe space for them to be creative dancers. If they want to do hip hop dancing, if they want to do ballet, that's what we're doing. We try to at least get them, if they want to practice or do, or what, they just need a space to be themselves. That's what that space is for. Well, that's awesome. So they have yeah, an opportunity to, uh, to express themselves through dance and, and to, to do that as well. So is this like an after school program? How does it, uh, how do they, how do they? It, it's after school program from like three okay. to six to seven o'clock at night. We have, you know, people there around the clock, uh, to help out just in, just in case if parents had nowhere to send their kids and they're still at work, they send them to us and then they pick them out at, pick them up after, or sometimes we even bust some of the kids home because we work with a large array of different, different types of kids with backgrounds, such as foster care parents, Kids are in juvenile detention city programs, uh, so we deal with a lot of different kids from every walk of life. So making sure they're good, so we we have uh, a vehicle to take them home afterwards. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, that, like you said, now with uh, with, um, with phones and and those type and tablets and all those type of things, kids are not as inclined to to exercise and to to be active. So. To have a, a space like this where they can do dance and to uh, you know kind of get some exercise because people think you have to go to the gym all the time to exercise, but there's other ways to exercise and playing sports and dance and doing all those type of things are another way to, to exercise and to move your body. So for you guys to provide that for the kids is a, a great thing that you guys you guys are doing. Yeah. So you guys are are you just in in the Florida area? Are you guys looking to expand or how's how's it? Uh, We're in. Uh, we have programs in Tampa. We have programs in Orlando. Uh, okay. we, we don't have a facility there yet, but we have uh, teaching artists, which is what we call them, artists who are skilled in music and arts and dance. We do have those teachers up there in those areas to still help out those uh, with kids in the in the high schools and in elementary schools if, when we don't have their facilities yet. So we still, we, we're still out there. Okay, nice. That's nice. And do you guys go out to the, to the schools as well? And do you, do you do like talks in the schools as well and then get them to, to come to the program to kind of promote your program to get kids to, to come? Uh, yeah, we, we, we usually go up there. Everybody knows about us. We go up there and we talk okay. to the principals. We're real cool with the teachers. And once kids see us in there, see how much fun we have after school is over, then usually more kids just come and drop by. But the kids mostly know about us through the principals and, and the teachers when we go up there. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of word of mouth through the, through the administration in the different schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. And so you do talks as well for the kids there. How, what's, uh, what's your involvement? What's your, I, I do, if they want to meet, sometimes I'll do like a camp where if they want to do football, uh, things, if they want to do a workout thing, I usually, you know, I was at a elementary school where I was doing after, after school, like kind of gym program. We used to get these kids to move around a little bit because all they were going to do was just sit and do classwork right after school. So I just, well, I just made a, a curriculum where they could do like circuit training, learn how to do a little circuit training. And then we play dodgeball and little game, fun games after that, just to keep the kids happy and keep them moving around. Because most elementary schools, they don't go, they don't do artistic programs or they don't go outside as much as they do anymore. So now it's just when kids are done with school, they get a, they, they have that energy pent up. So it's good to have those energy all spent out with us. And then when it gets back to their parents, they can focus on schoolwork. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Like I said, to have the outlet for them to to get their energy out and to to do something and be active is a is great that uh, that you guys are doing that down there. 
All right, so let's uh, uh, finish things off with what I call the uh, top of the mountain moment. So kind of kind of looking back on your your football journey and the things you've gone through in your your football career, the the highs and lows, and the, the obstacles and the the goods and the bad uh, things that you've gone through. Is there a is there a favorite moment, a favorite story, something that you you want to share? Uh, you know, advice for for younger players. What would you like to to say to finish things off? I would say. I say these kids need to start understanding what there's two different realms and that we deal with in this everyday lives. As far as people on this earth, we deal with the physical and we deal with the spiritual. Now the physical, we can always see what's coming. We can always understand it. We can always believe what I, I see. And the one thing that most people don't, but always underestimate is the spiritual value of what goes, what comes in out of your life. You're going to be more happy if you bond and you be, be around people who are spiritually connected to you as far as energy and they want to see you do good things. You are going to fall like a rock if you continue to, to be with people who are negative and it will drag you down. It will drag you down to a, your spiritual level, down to a physical plane where you're in, in a jail or you're getting, getting arrested or you're going to be in trouble. Please start understanding those two worlds. If you understand those two worlds perfectly clear, you will be able to always succeed no matter what you do in life if you put yourself around people who want to see you do good. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Larry. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for, for coming on the show. It's been a, a great interview. You're a, a great football player and a great person and doing great things in the community. And uh, again, for those who uh, want to uh, to help out, and do you guys accept donations as well? Do you guys have a... Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. We do. It's, on our, it's on our website, www.themotivationaledge.org. Okay, yeah, head to the website, and I'll have uh, the links to uh, the website on the, in the show notes as well. So if you want to donate and help out and contribute to the, the great things they're doing there in South Florida, then uh, you can just uh, click on those and, and do that. So, Larry, thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. All right, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to After the Gridiron. If you're a fan of the show, please make sure you subscribe to the show and also leave a rating and review. By doing that, you also help to spread the word about the podcast and assist others in finding the show so more people can enjoy this great content. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with the links to those being found on the website. Your support is very much appreciated. Also, please visit the resources page on the website for links to our sponsors and affiliates. Their support helps to keep the show running. So go to www.atgridiron.com slash resources to check them out. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you when we kick off our next episode.